latest YouTube video. Today I'm going to talk about a meme that I made a really long time ago, probably about a year after the first edition of the Human Magnet Syndrome was published, maybe 2014. It was codependents or SLDs, people who are self-love deficient. They take a handful of breadcrumbs and mistake it for a piece of bread. And that meme was really popular. People liked it. They shared it. They even wrote back and, and told me how they could use it to simply understand their codependency. And so what I did was I, I took this metaphor of bread as, you know, a nutritional piece of food and to use it as an explanation of a relationship that has two partners who share in the distribution of love, respect, caring and trust, LRCT. Incidentally, in my human magnet syndrome books, the definition of codependency, very simple definition, is a person who gives all of the love, respect, caring and trust in a relationship, wants it to be reciprocal or mutual, finds out that it is not. And depending on their personality, they either try to equalize it, but fail, or they never try to equalize it. And that is as simple as it needs to be because it cuts across all types of codependents or SLDs, all the personality types, all the differences, no matter if you're what I call an active codependent, a cerebral codependent, an anorexic codependent, or the other personality types, all are involved in relationships in which they give all, or if not most of the LRCT, love, respect, caring, and trust, they want it or hope that it will be returned. It's not in they stay. So I use LRCT as bread. In a healthy relationship, LRCT or a piece of delicious, yummy bread is given as much as it's taken. And no one counts or keeps track of it because it's done naturally because of someone's affection and love, because of someone's shared values, because of mental health a shared connection of two mentally healthy people. But the sad reality is SLDs, people with self-love deficit disorder, or as the world knows as codependents, they never experienced a relationship in which there was this mutual exchange of bread. And of course, if you are listening on my podcast, you missed my air quotes. The problem with SLDs is that they don't even think of a piece of bread because a long time ago, all the way back in their childhood, they were fed crumbs. They were fed pieces of bread that was very inconsistently given to them. They were hungry all the time. And when there were breadcrumbs or pieces of bread, that is what they thought of and that's what they came to understand as someone giving them nurturing, sustenance, support, caring, love, respect. And if you get used to it as a child and learn to adapt to times in which you get those little pieces of bread or the breadcrumbs, and that is good, that makes you happy, then you come to believe, well, that's the norm. I don't know much about diets, but the one thing that I know, and I don't know if it's actually scientifically proven, when you start a diet, your stomach shrinks. Well, essentially, once you start lowering the amount of calories that you eat, lowering the amount of food that you eat, your appetite shrinks. And should you, in the middle of a diet, all of a sudden eat the same amount of food that you did before the diet, it's likely that you'll feel like really bad or get sick. Well, what happens is, and again, I am talking to you as a non-medical practitioner. <laughs> but what happens is that your digestive system acclimates to the amount of food that you are getting and all the biological subsystems and major systems come into line and they expect a certain amount of, say, bread. And if the person doesn't get it, that person gets really hungry and consequently motivated to seek more of it. But if you are exposed to a sparse diet of metaphorical bread, LRCT, your system never gets used to feeling satiated, filled, you know, that happy feeling of going, oh, I can't eat anymore. It gets used to just 
having a couple bites and mouthfuls of bread and thinking, well, that's as good as it gets. And a child who comes from that environment, they learn to manage their expectations and not get so sad or mad if they're hungry, but find a way to just deal with it. So these are children coming from these dysfunctional families during the most important developmental phase in their life, which we call the attachment phase. They are severely traumatized and in, with some gaslighted, deprived, neglected, abused, and all sorts of terrible things. They come out of their childhood with thought patterns, beliefs, values, expectations about what they believe they deserve. And if you come from a family in which breadcrumbs was the norm, well, you just kind of grow up and that's your norm. And if you take that type of early conditioning, early development, indoctrination to what to expect from the world, and you go through this whole phase of your childhood, you come out of it with attachment trauma, the type of trauma that I talk about that is responsible for SLDD, self-love deficit disorder, or codependency. And that trauma crystallizes in your brain and it, it forms your expectations. It forms what you believe you want in a relationship, what you think is normal, which in the case of these children was being hungry all the time, what you do when you're hungry or what you don't do. And so by the time they get into adult relationships, especially romantic relationships, anything more than breadcrumbs is seen too much indulgent. And for some who have experienced a very traumatic childhood with a parent whose mood, say they had borderline personality disorder, whose mood and affect would dangerously shift in a moment's notice. And this loving pathological narcissist, someone with borderline personality disorder, would then all of a sudden see the child, and we're talking about the child within their development, as the enemy and would then hurt them. And because it's borderline personality disorder, it would cycle back to understanding and loving that child, feeling bad about the treatment and promising not to do it again. And of course, the cycle over and over again. So if you come from a childhood that can be understood as attachment trauma, you had parents, both the narcissist who was conditionally giving of the bread, who chose the people who they fed more based upon what that person did to them or how that person made them feel, and then starved the people that refused to comply with their expectations. And then in between the conditional feeding and provision of food or the very conditional starvation, then there was the rest of the family who never quite knew if they were going to get, in air quotes, fed or not. So if you are raised in an environment like that, you expect as an adult, an SLD or codependent adult, you get used to not being hungry. You get used to the preference and the value for being hungry and safe versus the very dangerous proposition of being hungry and asking for more than your narcissist will give you. So every SLD I know, including myself, especially back in early days of my recovery, will tell you how upset and resentful, sometimes angry, jealous they have been with their narcissist who will not give them what they deserve. And they talk about just taking scraps, but yet these breadcrumbs is enough sustenance or metaphorical nutrition that it's just easier to be hungry and believe that, well, that's just how it is. So that if a narcissist is nice to them, then they get happy. If the narcissist says something that they perceive as nice, but if someone was just a neutral onlooker and would say, well, that's not really nice. It's just the absence of, of bad, the absence of nasty. But those breadcrumbs, they're gobbled up. They are seen as love. They are mistaken for love, respect, caring, and trust. 
And like anyone who has a diet with an appetite that has been greatly diminished for a while, you can get used to it. But over time, you're going to get skinnier and skinnier and sometimes dangerously malnourished. So staying with the metaphor, the emotional, when I quote, body of the codependent gets thinner, emaciated. And instead of wanting and seeking more food, they choose the safety of being hungry versus the danger of asking for more food. It reminds me of one of my favorite sayings from Anais Nen, and the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. The codependent, the SLD, they get used to the breadcrumbs. They do their cost-benefit analysis intuitively, unconsciously, and always come up with the results. Well, breadcrumbs in Hungary is better than being unsafe, hurt, or punished. Maybe they were systematically manipulated to believe that this hunger is part of their what we call projective identification, which essentially is accepting the narcissist's projections or their unconscious attribution of the parts of themselves they hate onto others. So it's the SLD or the codependent's acceptance of these projections and belief that any other idea or explanation is just wrong. So no matter what it is, these starving codependents don't even know they're hungry. These starving codependents are happy sometimes to get just a handful of breadcrumbs, a piece of a piece of bread. In my Human Magnet Syndrome book, I explained the same phenomenon using different terms. And, and you guys probably know I, I love analogies, I love stories, I love metaphors, because they explain some very hard to understand, sometimes impossible to understand dilemmas, concepts, problems in a way that people can understand them and relate to them. One of my explanations is what I call codependency delusion. So let me start off with the basic definition of a delusion. It is a belief that is not supported in reality. People with severe mental illnesses have very serious and highly problematic and consequential delusions. Well, those delusions, those psychotic or schizophrenic or bipolar related delusions are not the same. We are talking about a milder version of it where you believe that you're going to get the love and the respect and the caring and the trust that you put into a relationship, you're going to get it back. And like a hamster in a hamster wheel, you get on that wheel and you move forward with that expectation, running furiously, stopping when you're tired and running again with that hopes that you're going to get what you believe you deserve, but you don't get it. And that is proof that this delusion is wrong. A codependent, an SLD, believes the narcissist is going to eventually love, respect, and care for them. They believe that if they do something, just right, they'll be able to convince the narcissist to see the light and not be so selfish. Or conversely, if they stop doing what they are told is wrong, which very well could be gaslighting, they are going to get the LRCT. Well, that is the codependent delusion, is to believe that your partner, your narcissistic loved one, is going to eventually give you as much LRCT as you give the other person. The other analogy I use comes from the study of child development, and it's called magical thinking. Children have this wonderful ability to imagine things in their mind, have imaginary friends, to have imaginary conversations, to believe things that are so far from factual truth. It is normal for a toddler and a young child to have magical thinking which is to believe that there's going to be a way to get what you want, you deserve, or someone promised you that you never really get. One day, daddy, say if daddy's a narcissist, he's going to show me love. One day, mommy, who is the codependent, is gonna stand up to daddy and say, stop hurting my kids 
and if you don't stop, I'm going to leave you. One day, I'm going to figure out exactly what daddy wants me to be and be that beautiful daughter or, or son that he's always wanted. Just one day. Well, that magical thinking, that fantasy rich thinking is a survival and a coping mechanism for the child because there's not a child in the world. In fact, it is a part of our evolution, our biology. We humans and other animals, it is built into us to want to love, to need to love our parents, despite any indication that they don't love us. I worked in foster care for a very long time, and I witnessed this with the kids who were taken away from their parents and would have these once monthly supervised visits, and they would get so excited and they would draw pictures and put on their best clothes and just be so almost manically excited to see the parent. And within a minute or two, the parent would act as they normally would. And in, in the cases that I'm talking about, the narcissistic parent would just have no interest in the child or would say something that would hurt the child and that child would be devastated and go back to their foster home and, and, be, and be upset and act out. But yet these children kept fantasizing about their parents. I guess what I'm trying to say is that all of this in combination, accepting little tidbits of love, respect, caring, and trust, and turning them into something bigger so you can imagine or believe that someone actually loves you and that you love someone and, and that love is going to have some benefit to you. In totality, it is not just a bad habit. As I said earlier, it comes from the child's upbringing. That is crucial to understand that the expectation and the acclimation to breadcrumbs is not a product of faulty thinking or faulty adult judgment. It is directly related to a survival or coping mechanism in their childhood that helped them survive a desert of a family in which there was not a lot to, and I say, quote, eat. And from that very important developmental phase of, of a person's life, then they have their expectations for others, or what I call a relationship template set. So if you are a person who has acclimated to breadcrumbs and found a way to see them as love, respect, caring, but you really know it's not true. And you can recognize your, your hunger pains as caused by starvation, not something you're doing to yourself or you have done to yourself, not because of your supposed mistakes or gaslit ideas about yourself that somehow justify in your mind you to be deserving of such hunger. And if we're going to solve this problem, which essentially is self-love deficit disorder, we have to understand the narratives, the tapes, the scripts of our childhood that were written so that we would be an appreciating recipient of breadcrumbs. While I was thinking about this video, I had this flash to this movie I saw when I was probably seven years old. It was Oliver Twist, Charles Dickens' famous book put into a movie. And there's a scene where a child comes up to the headmaster of the school and is really hungry because all those kids are suffering from malnutrition because of the selfishness and the lack of respect and caring for these children. So this boy, Oliver, goes up to the headmaster and says, sir, I want some more. And Mr. Bumble goes, what? Please, sir, I want some more. More? Snatch him, says Mr. Bumble. Whittle Corny says, hold him, scold him, pound him, trounce him, pick him up and bounce him. Oliver, never before has a boy wanted more, but he won't ask for more if he knows what's in store. So in this scene is a perfect example of the early environment where a child, before they are shut down, responds to their cravings and finds out that the consequence, the punishment for such a request so far exceeds 
their need that they shut it down. So in conclusion, if you are one of those breadcrumbs accepting SLDs, first, my heart goes out to you. It really does because I know so well what that deprivation, what that hunger feels like. It is extraordinarily painful to get used to being hungry and not complaining about it and eventually forgetting it. Because one day, if you are lucky, you're going to wake up and say, I am really hungry and this is not right. And when you are ready to do that, or you are ready to face your self-love deficit disorder, you are ready to embrace the pain, the trauma, not because it feels bad, who wants to embrace something that hurts them, but to know that the truth of what happened to you and your experience with it and how it shut down your memories, shut down your feelings, created your mind to think in all sorts of ways that make no sense, built up your expectations, your choice of what you believe are safe and loving people. Well, that can be changed. My self-love recovery treatment program works through the causes, the original causes of SLDD, which of course is the primary cause is attachment trauma. And from there, it reorientates a person for the first time in their life to want self-love and to fight for it. So I hope this presentation will help you understand why codependents or why SLDs seem so okay with being hungry all the time. And should you be an SLD who has accepted breadcrumbs or love, respect, caring, and trust, I am hoping that this discussion will prompt you to reevaluate, to embrace the pain of your hunger as something that can be changed. Until next time, don't forget that it is your birthright to be self-love abundant. Bye-bye.